Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming tonight. I'm Susan James, Library Manager here at Bayless and Assistant Director of the Superior District Library. I'd like to thank John Smolens for including us in his book tour, the Program Committee for Help with Planning, and the Friends of Bayless Library for the refreshments. An upcoming event, historian and author Larry Shabbat from Marquette also will speak at the um, Chippewa County Historical Society sponsored event on Wednesday, October 5th at 7 p.m. It'll be here in the room. His talk is entitled 12 True Sioux Tales. It's a tongue twister. Um, then we have our NEA Big Read events um, coming up, celebrating Edgar Allan Poe uh, throughout October at all of the Superior District Libraries. So check our newsletter or online calendar for details. We're very pleased to be hosting Marquette author John Smolens tonight. He's on tour for his latest historical novel, Wolf's Mouth, set partly in the UP. He studied at Boston College, the University of New Hampshire, and the University of Ohio. And he taught at Michigan State University, Western Michigan University, and is Professor Emeritus of Northern Michigan University. He's published 10 books of historical fiction, suspense, and short stories, including many you'll see on the table. His work has also appeared in numerous publications. In 2010, he was named Michigan Author of the Year by the Library Association, and ever since meeting him at that conference, I'd hoped to schedule a visit here. Tonight, he's speaking about Wolf's Mouth, that writer Keith Taylor has called an amazing accomplishment and that Bonnie Jo Campbell predicts is bound to become part of Michigan's folk history. Please welcome John Smolens. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, thanks for coming, folks. Um, this is, I've been informed. Can you hear me? Maybe make it a little, little higher, please. How's that? Thank you. I don't want to blow you out of the room either. Um, I think this is, this is a small enough room, and I taught long enough that I, I used to take pride. I taught at Michigan universities for 30 years. Um, and I used to take pride at being able to nail the kid in the back of the room with his hat on backwards who wasn't paying attention. But I could nail him with my voice. But now, you know, I'm not so sure. And I understand sometimes when people get to be about my age, the hearing gets a little bit on the weak side. So, uh, can you hear me all right? Okay. Nobody's got their hat on backwards, though. <laughs> and so, a few of my former students are here, so they know what I'm talking about. I used to be able to really boom it back there. Uh, Susan, thank you very much. Uh, um, one of the most intimidating things I've ever experienced, uh, first of all, I should say, one, one of the great honors I've ever experienced as a writer and as a person was to, to be selected as the, uh, the Michigan Author of the Year. I mean, it just, they gave me this, uh, I have a plaque that's framed and on my wall, and I even got this incredible um, document from the from Cong the state congress, signed by the governor and uh, I don't know, but all the mucky mucks down in Lansing, uh, sort of acknowledging that I was the Michigan author of the year. And I thought, boy, this, this is incredible. But the other side of the coin was they invited me to their annual convention, which that year was outside of um, Traverse City. And it was a luncheon. And I went in there and I would say, Susan, there maybe have, would have been at least 125 or more. Probably. It was a big room, they had lunch, and they were all librarians. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were asked to give a talk to a room full of librarians, it's, you know, it's not, it's not like ordinary people. <laughs> you don't look like ordinary people in me. Come on in, young man. Have a seat. We've got per prefer preferred seating everywhere. Um, Where to begin? Uh, Start at the beginning. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm gonna do that too. <laughs> Let me turn mine off. <laughs> That'll be him. Once years ago, in the first day of class, I, um, when cell phones were just becoming a factor in school life, uh, and I gave a spiel about you know turning off your cell phone before you come into class, so on and so forth. And this was a room full of freshmen, brand new fall term freshman. And uh, 20 minutes into the first class, a girl sitting right down the front, her phone begins to ring, and she's beat red, she's just, she's quaking. So I went over, I said, can I answer? <laughs> and she's looking at me like, what? Can I answer your phone? So she gives me the phone. 
And it was not her mother, it was her aunt. And uh, I had this lovely conversation with this woman. I forget the girl's name. Uh, it was Kristen or Kirsten, something like that. I said, well, she's, she looks like she's being well fed. She's dressed appropriately for the wedding. Uh, how do you get along with your roommate? You know, we had this, this back and forth, and she is just crump. Well, nobody's cell phone went off again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, uh, you know, uh, that's the power of example, particularly when you're dealing with a, group, a room full of people who are between 18 and 20 years old. Uh, I think I'll put mine away. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not trying to pressure you, you're already. <laughs> now that you see I own a sport car, I'm going to take it off because it's very comfortable. Jeez, <laughs> go ahead, right ahead. Now, um, uh, this is a, a, a work of fiction, and part of the story uh, takes place here in the UP, and the rest of it takes play, place in the Lower Peninsula. And I. You know, I wanted to write a book where we, I gave some, not necessarily equal time, but some time to the Lower Peninsula. I didn't want them to feel left out, because people often forget about the Lower Peninsula, particularly when they're from up here. Um, it is a work of fiction, although it did require a fair amount of, of, of um, research. Um, went in, and um, so what I'm going to do to start with is I, I'm going to read a few passages to you, although I'm not going to turn this into a, a real reading per se, but I'm going to walk you through some of the, what I've done is I've gathered the kinds of images that I collected in my mind and eventually I, f I went out and I found, which helped me to um, sort of get into the mood of this story, okay? So let me start out by telling you where the title comes from, Wolf's Mouth. Um, this is a story that um, is, for me, was different from my other books. Uh, I've written in the first person before, but most of my books have been in the third person and have rotating point of view. This is a story told by one character, and it's told by a man who is late in life. Uh, he's in his late 70s or older, all right? Uh, he is Italian, he was born in Italy, and I'm going to read the very first paragraph so that you get a sense of where he came from before he was in the States. Uh, and he was born, uh, now there's no, there's no autobiographical uh, information here, I don't have a drop of Italian blood in me, um, though I love all things Italian. And a couple of my students here, uh, former students, uh, actually went to Italy with me many years ago, and they, I think that they had a good time. Um, it's, it's meant that they've gotten married, so it, it worked. <laughs> um, but uh, for, th for this character, he's looking back on his life. So he's, the story takes place, it starts out literally when he's born and moves up through decades and decades. So the story would, from one part to the next, one section to the next, it goes from uh, World War II to the 1950s and then to the 1990s. So uh, it, it doesn't stay in one place, but the voice is always the same. Now the narrator's name, when he was born in Italy, is Francesco Giuseppe Verdi. And he, um, is born, the, the one thing, it's not autobiographical, but the one thing that I did that helped me to become, develop some sense of the time that he lived in, the different times he lived in, is I gave him the same birth, month, and year as my own father, who was born in August 1919. And as was the case with many men born in 1919, 20 years later, they served in, for some, you know, in, in the military for whatever country they were from uh, during World War II, which was the case with my father and was the case with this narrator. Uh, he served as a captain in the Italian army uh, until he was captured and then um, after uh, a, a spell of being incarcerated in um, sort of really makeshift prisons in the north of Africa, uh, like many other men, were shipped to uh, the United States. Uh, but let me tell you about where the title comes from, because it comes from Italian. It did, first of all, does anybody here speak Italian? Good. Okay. Because I speak enough Italian, so that when I go to a restaurant, I can order a meal, and I go to a hotel, I can order some, you know, a place to stay. Though sometimes I go to the restaurant, and I end up getting offered you know, a room, and I go to the restaurant, and they, they, you know, the vice versa. They, I get things confused. Uh, so I'm certainly not fluent, and my pronunciation isn't very good, but I can speak it to some degree. Um, the title comes from a very popular phrase 
a colloquialism that Italians use. You know how here uh, in the United States and other English-speaking countries, when you want to wish someone good luck, you say, break a leg, which doesn't really seem to make much sense. I mean, it goes against the grain of you're wishing someone good fortune. Italians have the same idea uh, in terms of a way of, of wishing someone good fortune. And what they say, and again, uh, I apologize for my pronunciation, but you wouldn't know anyway. So. Uh, let's suppose two opera singers were going to go out on stage, and just before they came out from behind the curtain, one would say to the other, in bocca al lupo, which means, I wish you to go into the wolf's mouth. And the op other opera singer would reply, crepi il lupo, which means, I wish the wolf to die. And that's their way of wishing each other good luck, you know, go out and break a leg. So that's where wolf's mouth comes from. That, that image, the wolf's mouth, uh, in Italian culture, I assume for centuries, uh, generations at least, has been, you know, it's that thing that you have to be brave, you have to be courageous uh, to defeat it. Uh, you have to go into the wolf's mouth and you have to hope that you can defeat the wolf, so to speak. So that's where the title comes from. Uh, let me read the very first paragraph, and then I'm going to show you some images uh, based on the early stages of the story. My mother often told the story about how I was born one afternoon in August 1919 in Macerata, a walled hill town that lies between the Sibyllini Mountains and the Adriatic Sea. Usually, she claimed that this sacred event occurred in the storeroom at the back of her family shop where cheese and sausages were kept cool, though sometimes she said it happened right on the stone floor behind the counter. Her telling likely included driving rain, thunder and lightning, and visions of angels and putti descending from the cathedral in nearby Loreto, though occasionally my father reminded her that the birth was brought on so swiftly because of the heat that often plagued central Italy in the summer. The point was always, that my mother worked every day in the shop while she was pregnant, which was intended to be instructive, if not inspirational. For she and my father both believed that one's life was measured by what one could endure and how one could tolerate and adapt to any circumstance. I was christened Francesco Giuseppe Verdi in honor of our distant relative, the great composer, whose portrait hung next to the crucifix on our dining room wall. So that's the narrator at the beginning of his life, a boy raised in central Italy. I selected Macerata because uh, way back in 2003, I was fortunate enough to be selected to teach there for one semester, which is where I developed my, my affection for the, the culture. I already love the food and the wine, but uh, when I went there, I realized that uh, there's more to it than that. Um, so now let me show you some images. Uh, Francesco, in the early pages, you understand that he was a captain in the army, as I said, and after fighting in southern Italy, eventually is shipped across the Mediterranean and fights in the north of Africa. And we often associate this army with uh, the German uh, uh, General Rommel. Uh, they often called him the Desert Rat because he was, he was very successful at eluding the Allies until eventually uh, the, the Allies really took control. And they, what happened by 1943, is um, the Allies were really starting to push back in many places throughout Europe and North Africa. And they were, suddenly they had the responsibility for a great many prisoners. And they didn't have any place to really house them. Now, uh, the solution they came up with, which in some ways was really quite, quite brilliant. Um, once the United States got into World War II, and as you, as you know, um, uh, they didn't get in at first. But once they were in, we were developing and manufacturing armaments and transportation and equipment and, and, uh, you know, and sending it over there. And that was, that was a major uh, contribution to our, our winning the war. Uh, so there were these enormous convoys of, of supply ships going across the Atlantic that were full going over to Europe and empty coming back. So by 1943, when they realized that they, they suddenly had all these prisoners, and I mean thousands, they began to, to fill these ships with prisoners and send them back here and put them in prisons all around the United States and in some uh, camps in Canada as well. And I understand Canada is about two blocks that way, right? <laughs> um, because 
because of the war, there was a manpower shortage, uh, particularly in agriculture and in lumbering. So a lot of the camps were placed in places like the American South, where the men would uh, be in camps, but they would work on local farms and in the fields. And obviously up here in places like UP and Wisconsin, uh, they would work in very traditional lumber camps, but they were still prisoners of war. Um, so now, um, can you see that okay? Oh, good, that, 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 that's better, I, I hope. Um, one of the things, when you write historical fiction, um, and as you do your research, you realize that historians never agree. I mean, there's a, some factual things that, you know, everybody accepts the fact that our first president was George Washington. But history is really a matter of interpretation. Uh, and if you read deeply enough into any particular period or about certain events or certain people, uh, you realize that historians disagree. And you also realize that a lot of what is presented as fact is often erroneous. Or it really doesn't, doesn't jive with, with things that you learn elsewhere. Now this map is a perfect example. Um, in the United States, in the latter stages of the war, there was, and again, there isn't an exact number, it varies, but at least 170 prisoner of war camps throughout the lower 48 states. This map is intended to represent, I can't even remember where I got it, but it's intended to represent uh, all these camps. And I'm sure there are not 170 dots on this map. But you can see how heavy a concentration of camps there were down in uh, the Mississippi Delta states, because, again, because of the, um, the agriculture, and to some degree up north. But please note, there were, in Michigan, there were 32 camps, both peninsulas. In the upper peninsula, there were five camps. Now, on this map, uh, at least they did have the decency to show both peninsulas. <laughs> you know how maps tend to leave the lower peninsula out and just show us. Um, there's no 32 dots in, in the state of Michigan. And please note that in the Upper Peninsula, there isn't one dot. So this is a very inaccurate map. But this is what you have to kind of wade through and make assessments about what is, what is, um, what is useful and what is not. Um, in the UP, there were five camps. Uh, Camp Autrain is the one where the story really takes place, at least the first two sections of the book, the first half of the book, really is in Autrain, train which is I'm sure you know is um, approximately 25 miles east of Marquette um, pretty much halfway between Marquette and Unising um, uh, very close within a few miles of Lake Superior uh, Camp Evelyn is not too far from there Camp Pori is out in the western UP Camp Reiko is not too far from here I was talking to a gentleman earlier uh, who, who's been there um, uh, it's, it's not too far from this part of, uh, of the UP. And Camp Sidnaw is also out west. Um, now there was a sixth camp, which enters briefly into the story, uh, in the town with that unique name, Germfask. Do you know how, where the name Germfask came from? Where did it come from? Isn't it the first initial of the last names of the founders? Yes, yes. The founding families could not agree. They, 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 they came up here to the North Woods and they established a settlement and they couldn't agree on what to call the place. So they simply took the first letter of their, their last names and, and constructed germ fast out of it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to primarily talk about Camp Autrain training because that's where the story really takes place. That's where Francesco Verdi uh, was incarcerated. And again, this is fiction. It's based, I did a lot of research. I try to keep it as historically accurate as possible, but um, uh, the characters are fictional. Um, if you were to go out into the woods there, you would see a little evidence of the old camp, but not much. Um, there is still a um, guard tower that is pretty much uh, embraced by trees. I mean, all you know, most of the vegetation has grown up, you know, uh, just completely changed from what it was back in the 40s, obviously. Um, there's also uh, things like um, you can find foundation buildings were placed on uh, concrete foundation or stone foundation. Sometimes you can see that. Uh, I think there's a set of sta uh, concrete stairs that's still visible. And occasionally, um, just out in the woods, you'll suddenly see what you realize might have been a fence post, a wood post, 
um, that is clearly man-made, but it's you know it's been so weathered and it's twisted by the by the by age and everything. But they 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 that was probably part of the fences. So there's some evidence, but the camp itself really does not uh, exist anymore. The, 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 the nature has reclaimed it. Um, now I'm sorry. Some of these pictures are probably a little small. Uh, these ca these pictures are of camps. Um, well, this is, they, these are actually downstate, but in, in some cases they were actually in tents. Uh, but more often than not, they were really in barracks that were very similar to you know what you would expect of a military um, uh, uh, situation. Uh, this is a little bigger. This is Camp. Um, um, I think this is Camp. Ra yeah, this is Camp Rako. Yeah, it says down the right-hand corner. Uh, the same perspective from uh, two times during the year. Obviously, uh, the winters were very tough. Uh, as you can see, these buildings are very Spartan. Uh, they often were only sided with tar paper and those white vertical stripes are just wood battens to keep the paper from, you know, being dislodged by the, uh, by the wind and so forth. Uh, and obviously these men had to deal with uh, very heavy snow and so forth. The interior was probably very similar to the kind of barracks that they uh, were in when they were still, um, uh, you know, fighting. Um, unless they were in the field, obviously. Uh, you may not be able to see, but there is a wood-burning stove here. I'm sure the building was drafty, but it was warm. Um, when I talk to people about this book, uh, people from Michigan, uh, the most common resp first response is, I didn't know that there were POW camps in Michigan, let alone the United States. Um, I didn't either. And I can't tell you exactly when I first learned about this. It was a, at least a dozen years ago. There was a series of articles in the daily newspaper, Marquette Mining Journal, about Camp Autrain and about the camps in general, but focused on Autrain because that's closest to Marquette. And I didn't immediately say, oh, I'm going to write a novel about this. But this is the kind of story that you kind of stick in the back of your mind and you let it fester for a while. And then over time, I began to just look into, well, OK, where were these camps? Uh, is there any evidence of them left? Uh, what, what was the men's experience? I mean, I didn't want this book to just be about you know, the history of that we had these camps, but what was it like to be in them? And so, and much of the research that I, that I dug out, old newspaper articles and books and so forth, uh, the men who, serve, who, who were incarcerated here, for the most part, um, thought it was a pretty good deal. They were treated far better than they had been when they were fighting in the war. They were better fed. They were usually better housed. They were warmer, even though they were up north here. Uh, and many of them often couldn't help but say how surprised they were that the Americans were nothing like they were believed. And that's one of the things that I kind of try to work into the story at, at various points. Um, many of the soldiers in various countries in Europe, I don't want to harp on one particular country, but many of the soldiers um, really felt that they were, they were fighting um, an evil force, that, that we were almost like another race. And even though we were sort of known as being the smiling people, that was, uh, that was part of our deception. And yet, they, by, the, by the end of their time being in the camps when the war was over, and in years later, they would say, you know, um, the Americans weren't anything like we, we were told that they were. And interestingly, a fair number of the men who had been incarcerated in uh, uh, American camps during the war, in many cases, they would, they would try to come back to the United States and become citizens and have done so. This is not what happened to Francesco, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, these are some more pictures. That's a mess hall at the, um, uh, um, uh, at the top. And uh, this is uh, another picture from Camp Rako. And, um, I've gone out to Camp Autrain to look around and see what's there, and there's not much. Uh, you may not know, but there is a Lake Autrain, which probably, it's only less than a mile or a mile and a half from Lake Superior, off of Route 28. At its widest point, I don't think it's much more than a mile wide, give or take. And uh, one of the things that I also realized about these men, and I, is in one of the early scenes in the story, they had, when they were brought here to the United States and brought to a very remote part of the, the, the country, such as Autrain, they really had no idea of the geography. They didn't know how far they were from anything. And there was at least one instance where a couple of the uh, POWs 
thought that Camp Au Train, uh, uh, Lake Au Train was Lake Superior. And that Lake Superior on the other side was Canada. And so there was one instance where they proceeded to swim across Lake Au Train, thinking they were going to escape to Canada and be able to get home from there somehow. And some American guards saw them swimming out, knew exactly what was going on, so they drove a jeep around to the other side and they had blankets because they, the water was cold. And when the guys got out, they, they said, welcome to Canada. And you know, if we rush, we'll get you back in time for dinner. Um, that's how out of it they were. They, they, re they had no concept um, uh, of, of where they were, which is why, the, even though there were guards and there were fences and so forth, the men had uh, what by today's standards may seem to be remarkable freedom. They could come and go from the camp not at will, but they could leave in groups. They often were seen in the communities that surrounded the camps. Um, uh, there were, I saw many quotes from American citizens who lived in villages like Munising, for example, or downstate, or in other states for that matter, who said that, you know, it wasn't a top secret that these camps uh, existed, but the government didn't go out of their way to let people know, well, we're going to place, you know, several hundred prisoners uh, in your vicinity. But all of a sudden they would realize that um, uh, you know, there are these men who speak a different language who are walking in groups to, uh, to go into town in the evening or they're going in the morning, they're, they're going and they're suddenly working out in fields. So this was a very common occurrence. Um, downstate, there was, they, they, they served uh, in, the, in the farm fields and I understand that in the, the thumb area of the lower peninsula, there's a lot of beet farming and they, they used to work in the beet fields an awful lot. Um, the uh, part one ends right about new, right within a day or so of New Year's Eve and New Year's Day of 44 to 45 and um, one of the things that I, I love doing uh, I, I love about doing the research is going into libraries and finding things that probably have not been looked at in a long time finding books that nobody has checked out in decades um, uh, I love going through old newspapers that are on microfiche or sometimes microfilm. Um, I read uh, several months worth of the newspapers in the Marquette area that dating from say the fall of 44 into the winter of 45 so that when I was writing certain scenes I had a good idea what the weather was, how deep was the snow because eventually Francesco does try to escape. Um, you can't have a prisoner of war story without an attempted escape. Um, in many cases when men escaped, as in the little anecdote I told, told you earlier, they, they were usually, they, if they were not captured quickly, they turned themselves in quickly because they were lost, they were hungry, they were cold, you know, they realized that their only means of survival was to go back. There were over 425,000 POWs in the United States by 1945. Uh, out of that number, uh, it's estimated, and again, figures aren't firm, but it's estimated that approximately 2,200 somehow managed to slip through the cracks of the bureaucracy or escape and not be found. The rest of them, at, when the war was over, they were returned to their home countries. But about 2,200 of them somehow stayed in the United States. And as you go into the later stages of the story, Francesco, the next part of the story is in 1956. Francesco is one of these, these um, prisoners who managed to escape and stay out. And the means uh, by, uh, to, to, uh, the, the, the way that he uh, managed to do this was he changed his identity. He had the assistance of a young woman uh, who uh, was Italian American, who was uh, originally from the Sioux. And then she and her mother moved to um, Munison. Um, and without her help, I mean, they fall in love. There's a love story. Uh, he probably, he, he would not have been able to uh, successfully get out of the UP. And so that 12 years after the war, they're living down in Detroit, which at that time, in the 50s, as you know, was a boom town. Um, uh, Big Three was building cars like crazy. Um, and suddenly, Francesco Giuseppe Verdi, changed, his name has become Frank Green because Verdi in Italian means green. And his, uh, his, eventually his wife, whose name is Chiara Frangipani, beautiful name, she becomes Claire Green. And um, 
So this is really about a story about a man who, to survive, becomes a chameleon. He adapts, he changes. English is not his first language, and yet in the latter stages of the book, he speaks like any other American. He dresses like Americans. He does everything he can not to stand out. The interesting thing about the, the actual men, the 2,200 or so, who did escape and stayed away, is they did the same thing as Frank. In most cases, uh, they, they changed their identities. They often married American women. They had families. They had jobs. They paid taxes. And they didn't break the law. They're perfectly law-abiding citizens. And in many cases, it wasn't until a decade or later that they finally were found out. And I read numerous articles in magazines and newspapers about finally a certain man who had a, a, a business, say, in Chicago or Detroit, suddenly his, his real identity was revealed. And the American government didn't know what to do with him because they discovered that they didn't have a law on the books on what to do with an escaped prisoner from World War II because according to legal experts that they spoke to, um, they, these men had been brought to the United States against their will which placed them in a, a unique legal situation. So there were various um, uh, solutions. One of the most common ones was that if this, if the, this man was um, uh, a law-abiding citizen and if he had set roots here in the United States, had a family, had a business and so forth, uh, they would say, look, we're going to send you back to your native land uh, and you need to stay there for about a half a year and then we're going to allow you into sort of a fast track um, list to be considered uh, um, so that you could immigrate into the country and come to stay. And that's what most men did. They would leave and then they would apply uh, to, to re-enter the United States and eventually become citizens. Uh, now, that's not exactly what happened to Francesco. His past starts to catch up with him. Uh, let, me, let me read a, a little bit of, um, if I can find it here. What happens in the, uh, in the camps, and this happened very often around the country, is if you had several hundred men in the camps, um, the majority of them were German soldiers, but there were also Austrians and Italians and so forth. And of that majority, a small percentage would be ardent Nazis. And they took it upon themselves to really kind of run the daily lives of the men in that camp. And they were determined that, you know, all of the men, all of the, the prisoners uh, act accordingly. Uh, so the difficulty that Francesco and some of the other men run into is that they are, uh, that he's, he's, he's somehow bucking against the, the, how the Nazis expect them to behave. Um, he does things like, they have a soccer team. And then somewhere I have a picture, I have pictures of soccer players. There we go. Uh, Il calcio in Italian is soccer, okay, or football as they call it. Uh, they play soccer and he has been designated, he's been elected as the team's coach or captain. And he said, I'll only do this if I select the best players from all, among all the men and play, you know, who I think will be able to compete best because they can play matches against the other um, camps in the area. So when he selects a team and only one of the starting members of the team is German. Um, the commandant, whose name is Vogel, uh, this, this does not sit well with him at all. So as the story progresses, Francesco and several of the other men, some of them German, some of them from other countries, um, really start to run into uh, uh, this, this stone wall. Vogel expects them to be exactly the way um, a good Nazi is, and they, you know, they want nothing to do with that. So eventually, um, and again, this is based on history. Uh, men were beaten, uh, men were uh, mutilated, and in some cases, men were killed who did not comply in camps all around the country. Another means of persuasion that they had was the um, the the prisoners could write back home. The, their, their letters and cards, they, you know, they, they would be inspected by, by the Americans before they were sent, but they could write back home and they could use codes to send messages. So it, another means of persuasion was to tell a soldier who was not really 
falling in line that um, we know where your family lives. We know that they're in Berlin or wherever. And uh, you know, if you don't line up, we're going to uh, uh, send word back that something bad could happen to them. So they had many means of persuasion. And eventually they, they as I said, in some cases men were killed or mutilated, uh, which happens in this camp. And Francesco realizes he has no choice but to escape. Um, let me move ahead a little bit more. How are we doing for time? Uh, this, this is, uh, well, I, I already told you that there was over 170, over 170 camps in the United States, and there was um, over 425,000, which, again, I think most Americans didn't realize that, that, that so many had been brought over. The camps up north were lumber camps. Uh, they didn't have power tools. They didn't have chainsaws. They used, uh, uh, you know, used muscle and, 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 and hand saws uh, to cut lumber, which was often used to, um, uh, for, uh, to, for pulp wood, which was needed in um, uh, the war effort. Uh, one of the things that was interesting, and I'll show it, there'll be some things shown later. Uh, when you, if you read, uh, newspapers and magazines that were published during the war, um, the, all these publications really stress how it was every citizen's responsibility to um, contribute in any way they could to the war effort. For example, if you were reading the front page of, say, the Marquette uh, Mining Journal, there often was a big display, a box up in the upper right-hand corner of the front page that would say, save this paper, support the war effort. So people would say they would have stacks of paper and then eventually they would, they would turn it in and that paper would probably be taken somewhere where it, where it would be put to good use. Uh, same thing with clothing. Uh, obviously you know about gas rationing and, 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 and rationing cards for, for food. Um, so this whole sense that um, uh, um, everybody had to pitch in, uh, they needed wood just as, that they, as they needed to have people har do the harvesting down in uh, the warmer climates. Uh, not all the Americans who lived near these camps were um, pleased about it. In many cases, it didn't seem to bother people. Um, they would realize suddenly that there were these camps and there were foreigners out there, but since there was no trouble, they didn't make a big deal about it. But in some cases, uh, I don't know if you can read uh, the text here, but these are old clippings from local newspapers. I don't even know what states they're from, I can't remember. but. Uh, there were instances where uh, the locals would really, you know, protest and complain. The photograph in the middle is uh, a couple of men with placards, and one says, Old Glory is our flag, Southbury wants no swastika. Um, one of the interesting things was in the Deep South, um, where the prisoners were often working on, in the fields, um, African Americans, and of course, this is a very time in our, a different time in our, our history. Um, African Americans were very upset that in many cases, these foreign prisoners of war were housed better and fed, fed better than blacks who worked in the fields. Um, but this was a time when, when those things, unfortunately, that, that was the case. Um, I love to find things like this where uh, you, you got images of what the home life was like. Uh, they were constantly reminding you to um, uh, save clothing or turn things in so they can be used by someone else. Um, and the left it says, use it up, wear it out, make it do. Uh, and this woman is stitching up the, the back pocket of a fellow's trousers. trousers. Um, a lot of posters were uh, applauding the efforts of women on the home front, working in factories and, and doing jobs that uh, the men had vacated. Um, and again, on the right, it was go through your wardrobe and, 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 and make contributions. Now, Francesco, in his uh, uh, attempts to be a, um, become an American, to, to identify, be identified as American, uh, he really tries to absorb our culture, uh, and he's very keen to, uh, he, before he even came over, he, he was fascinated by American jazz and big band music. And he became extremely um, uh, um, taken by music by Glenn Miller and the Dorsey Brothers and so forth. When I was a boy, my father 
that's what I heard all the time before Elvis Presley came along and changed everything. Um, so Glenn Miller, uh, throughout Francesco's life, uh, he is infatuated with, with all these conspiracy theories about what happened to Glenn Miller. Do you know what happened to Glenn Miller? Does anyone remember or know? Yeah, there was a crash, or there believed to have been a crash. Uh, just at the same time, oops, what happened here? Oh, oh. Okay. Hmm. Do I have to start up again? Hmm. I don't know what I did. Yeah, well, I, I don't think this is plugged in tight. Well, if it doesn't work, it's too bad. I was going to show you a picture of uh, a poster of Snow White. <clears throat> really? I don't know. All right. Well, let, let's let, let's let it go. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to read. A, I'm going to read a little bit anyway. Um, but let me finish about uh, Glenn Miller. Uh, the point of the uh, at the point when when Francesco is going to uh, he decides he has no choice but to escape from uh, the prison. It's just a, a day or two before the, the turn of New Year from 44 to 45, which is the same time that um, suddenly Glenn Miller. The Allies are now moving across Europe. They're retaking much of France. Uh, he has been, he was, he was really a symbol for uh, 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 the Americans. Uh, he spent a lot of time over there. His bands you know, performed and, and, and entertained the troops. He was scheduled right around New Year's to have a big concert in Paris to help welcome the troops as they liberated the city. So a few days before uh, 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 New Year's in 1945, he gets in a small plane in, in England, and he flies across the, the English Channel, and they never hear from his plane again. And there's all sorts of theories, conspiracy theories. And uh, I mean, it's as, as elaborate as this conspiracy theories that surround things like the JFK assassination. People have come up with really wacky ideas about how he was actually a spy, and so on and so forth. But the probability is his plane crashed into the English Channel. And in fact, there were some men who were flying uh, bombing raids over the continent who said when they were returning across the channel, returning back to England, they used to drop whatever bombs they had not dropped on the raid, they dropped into the ocean because they, did, they, didn't have, they wanted to have no bombs when they landed because that obviously could lead to real problems. And there was one plane they said, you know, we dropped our bombs and we think one of them might have hit a small plane below us, but we can't be sure. So nobody really knows, but Francesco, throughout his life, was just completely enamored with this whole idea of well, what happened to Glenn Miller. Um, uh, well, I, there's other images that I was going to show you. I, was, I, I would ha now I would have taken you into Detroit and into the 1950s and shown you beautiful images of the the cars that we manufactured in those days, um, which I think really uh, they're, they're American works of art. Some of them. Um, like you want to try it? Okay. Yeah. All right. While you do that, then I'm, I'm, I'm trying yeah. to find. I want to find uh, a portion to read, but maybe I'll, I'll skip uh, to. Okay. Now I'm going to take a little bit of a risk with you. Uh, as I was telling Susan, we had dinner beforehand, and I said um, the hardest thing to do, or something I should avoid doing, is when I go to a town where part of the story is set. You want to avoid reading portions that are describing that town because inevitably there's going to be people in the audience who are going to say no 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 it's not that way at all <laughs> that street is not there it's, it's two blocks down and my grandmother used to live on that block so I know what I'm talking about okay so you're welcome to do that that's fine but uh, I'm going to read you just a couple little passages that are set here in Sault Ste. Marie uh, let me set it up for you after a number of years of living in um, Detroit uh, Frank and Claire Green are law-abiding citizens uh, he's a small businessman. Uh, he has a business where he sells lampshades. And the name of this, the company is Made in the Shade. Okay. 
Uh, this is the only thing that is not, again, not autobiographical, but is slightly connected to my background. My father also was a salesman. He didn't sell lampshades. But I, when I grew up, I understood that uh, in those days, a man had to, uh, to be a salesman, you had to develop a certain persona because you had to make it, you know, you were really selling yourself as much as the product or products. So Frank has this ability to kind of work on people very subtly to get them to want, want to buy their products. Um, so he's going along for a number of years. He's not rich, but he's doing all right. He and his wife live in an apartment. Uh, they have friends. And then, one, but he's always looking over his shoulder. And then one day, a, a, a government agent, a U.S. government agent, approaches him and says, "I know who you really are. Uh, I know you, you. You dress like Americans. You've learned the language. You talk just like an American. You've become a baseball fan. You drink Stroh's beer." Uh, he said, you've, "You know, you've got it. You've got the whole thing down. The only thing, the only weakness, and, and again, oh, we have it." Yes. All right. I'll, I'll get to it in a moment. Well, let me skip ahead. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm jumping uh, past things. But since I'm talking about Detroit, let me go ahead. And part three is in Detroit. So this is images from Detroit in the 50s. Elvis Presley in, a, in the left-hand corner. Uh, the old soda fountains in, in down below. Uh, that's the skyline in those days. And the thing about Detroit that I tried to capture in some of the scenes was um, people in the streets, there was a throng. Public transportation was still used by a great number of citizens in, in cities like Detroit, Chicago. Now it was right around the middle of the 50s when all of a sudden they started to cut back on public transportation because they wanted people to buy cars. But still, you know, Frank goes, comes and goes uh, uh, to work usually uh, in either a bus or a trolley that's on an electric line. And since I grew up playing hockey and, 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 and am still a hockey fan, I had to have a picture of the great Gordy Howe in the upper corner who was playing when I was a boy. Um, so there, here are some images from post-war Detroit, and these are the kind of images that I wanted to sort of uh, present through this part of the story. Um, I love American blues, particularly the citified blues that, that, that grew up in places like Chicago and Detroit. Um, and then, of course, there were the cars. There were, there were passages where I did a lot, I'm not, I, I'm not a car buff, but I did a lot of research into what were some of the really cool cars of the period. And I mean, the detail that they had, this is, this is the, one of the, 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 uh, um, uh, the hood ornament from uh, a particular model of a Pontiac. Um, they were often two-tone, uh, and of course there were the fins. Um, some of you may be able to remember the transition from 1956 to 57. 57 was the year when the big fins came in. 56, they had rounded fins. They were kind of muted. And then all of a sudden, 57, they, they, they were taking from the whole idea of space travel. They were trying to make the cars kind of look like rocket ships that were going to take off. Um, I mean, to those of you who are a little bit younger in the audience, you go, wow, really? Um, this was, I, when I, grew, I grew up in, in Massachusetts, and at the end of my street, there was a Chevrolet dealer. And as kids, in the fall, when the new line of cars came out, as soon as word went around the neighborhood that you know the new Chevys are down in the showroom, we'd go down and look in the plate glass windows. And in 57, it was, I mean, it's like these things fell out of space. Uh, they were really, really something. And the detail, again, uh, I just went crazy uh, uh, picking these out. This, car up in the right hand corner is a 1956 Chevy sedan, uh, the first car I owned when I was in college, and it was, I wasn't in college in 56. Um, it, was a, it, was, it was a 56 Chevy, it was all white, it wasn't two-tone, uh, had no heater, but boy, it, it could, still, could still go. I paid $120 for it and I ran it for about two and a half years. Uh, oh, and there's also lampshades. Uh, even the lampshades are pretty cool. Okay, and, I, and they're, they're, I, I, I worked in a lot of baseball. Uh, I also love baseball. And I, I wanted to make sure that when he's in, in, the, in Tony's bar and grill, which he goes to after work because he's pals with Tony, um, and the ball game is always on the radio. It wasn't on TV yet, but the ball game was on the radio. I wanted to make sure I knew who the, the, the Tigers announcers were at the time. Okay, uh, stuff like that. And of course, there's also the element of, you know, America, we, uh, we were still a segregated society. Uh, civil War, the, the Civil Rights Movement, excuse me, 
we were just on the cusp of that. Um, this is in the story to a, a limited degree. Um, Frank's shop is very small. Uh, he does sell retail right off the street, but most of his business is is um, with business, with uh, restaurants, hotels, which is a good deal for him because you know a restaurant or a hotel will buy dozens in many cases of the same shade. He has one employee, uh, uh, a fellow whose name is Leo Kuhn, who is black and he's also a midget. And so there are scenes where Leo is involved and I hope that it gives a sense of what life may have been like at that time between the races in a city like Detroit. Uh, I also love to find images of what men and women dressed like at the time. Uh, men wore suits and ties, not always, but uh, it was if you walked the streets of Detroit on a, on a, during the workday, most men would be wearing suits and ties. Um, when the U.S. government agent first approaches Frank, uh, and he says, you know, you've done a really great job, you would pass for an American to almost anyone, he said, but there's one flaw in your, 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 your new persona. He said, it's your shoes. I know you're Italian because you love really good Italian shoes. And in fact, Frank could never give up his good Italian shoes. So I've got some good Italian shoes there, the two-tone shoes. And the women's fashions also were um, uh, uh, something that I really enjoyed. Uh, that's Audrey Hepburn uh, over on the right, and uh, Jean Kelly, uh, um, not Jean Kelly, I'm sorry, Grace Kelly, Princess Grace Kelly with uh, Jimmy Stewart from uh, the movie Rear Window. And the music. Uh, there's a scene in Detroit uh, when there's a little bit of tension, which is sort of undermined when Frank is he's following someone. Um, this part of the story is kind of, there's a bit of a noir uh, quality to it, I hope, because people are following each other and, mm. so, and sort of trying to keep up, you know, from being discovered. Uh, he's following this man through a neighborhood in Detroit and a group of schoolgirls come down the street arm in arm and they're singing one of the songs that was very popular in 1956, Doris Day's Que Sera Sera, which is an Italian phrase which means whatever be, will be, will be. Um, of course, she doesn't, she doesn't pronounce it the way an Italian does. Italians use a very soft R or a rolled R. We would say que sera, sera. An Italian would say, no, 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 it's, 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 it's sera. But anyway, so th there are times when he encounters these Americanized versions of Italian culture. And he, he tries very hard not to speak up, say, no, no, you get that all wrong. He didn't want to blow his cover. Uh, Late in the story, um, we move to uh, when he's an old man, okay? Uh, and now I am gonna read a little bit to you before I get to the latter stages. Um, after a number of things happen in Detroit, which I won't explain because I don't wanna uh, give them away. Uh, he and Claire, have to, they have to get out of Detroit. And because Claire was originally from the Sioux, uh, she returns up here. Her mother has since died. Her mother's quite elderly and died, but they have friends, family friends. They come and they can, they, they meet, they, they have, for a winter, they can hide out in, in Sault Ste. Marie, okay? So let me read uh, a little passage here. Um, Most fall afternoons, we take a walk through town, an unusual sight in Sault Ste. Marie, then in the mid-50s. Mid oh, excuse me. There's two women in Frank, okay? There's Frank, Claire, his wife, and there's this other woman who is currently living with them. And again, um, you, I don't wanna, it would take too long to explain why she's there, but it's three people. It's, it's not a couple, it's two women and a man walking through this park. Uh, most of all afternoons, we, we take a walk through town, an unusual sight in Sault Ste. Marie than in the mid 50s. On the sidewalks and in the stores, we couldn't miss the furtive glances and overt stares. We're a freak show, Claire said one afternoon. The pregnant woman, she was pregnant. The wounded man, he was wounded. And what are you, she said to Braun, she's the other woman. I'm the tart, Braun said. The Detroit tart. 
They laughed while I avoided doing so because it only caused a searing pain in my chest. He had a, he was injured and, and they would have caused him pain. We entered the park that bordered the locks and Ordok, which had come up the St. Mary's River, slowly rose on the flo uh, flooding waters. This was our daily entertainment, watching these massive ships, some a thousand feet long, rise and fall in the locks before heading out into Lake Superior or downriver to the lower Great Lakes, transporting, transporting Taconite to Chicago, Detroit, or Toledo. Beyond the locks, the harbor was a marvel of industry, boats and barges passing beneath a smudged, smudged sky, the ominous perpetual racket of the blast furnace, furnaces at Algoma Steel thundered across the water from Sault Ste. Marie, Canada. So there are some scenes, and there's one other little scene I think that takes place. Um, maybe I, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, I'll skip that one. Um, but anyway, for a period of time they live here in the soup, and then certain things develop affecting the lives of all three of these people. And then the story eventually, uh, when Frank is an old man, when he's telling the story, he is now living over in Marquette. He's actually living about three or four blocks from my house. I mean, when I, sometimes when I walk down toward the lake, I, I say, that could be Frank's house. Um, late in the story, now we're into the 1990s, so we're, this story takes place over about almost a half century. Late in the story, uh, much of his past, his wartime past, is, has really come back, and you know how um, still to this day, now that the World War II generation is really starting to die off, they're in the 90s, there's still, you still see in the news sometimes that, particularly in Europe, there are war crime trials. And some man, usually it's a man, uh, had, is believed to have had some connection to something that happened in the war, often connected with the concentration camps or whatever. And they're put, put on trial. Uh, I think we've all seen this sort of thing. Again, this, my, the trial in my story is fictional, but it's based on, on that sort of thing. And though Frank is very reluctant to get involved, eventually he is persuaded that, it's, that he needs to go back to Europe and testify in such a trial where he's dealing with another very old soldier from World War II, okay? Um, and I won't tell you what happens there. You really, you gotta read up to that point. Um, and finally, and then we'll, I'll take some questions and answers here if you want, or I'll give you answers if you ask me questions. Um, uh, I'd love to end with just images of the region. Um, on the left, in the lower left, is uh, the Lower Harbor in, in Marquette. My house is just off the left edge of the picture, up on the hill. Um, and the, the clock tower is downtown Marquette, uh, probably one of our most um, uh, easily identified uh, buildings um, in, in town. Up in the left hand, right hand corner are the Sulaks from the sky. Uh, and that's Lake Superior down the lower right hand corner. So the story takes place in both peninsulas, but primarily it begins up here, goes downstate, pays tribute to the lower peninsula, but then it comes back up to our wonderful upper peninsula. So that's the story of Wolf's Mouth without telling you everything. Uh, any questions? Anything you'd like me to chat with you about? You yeah. Don't, you don't speak fluent Italian, yet you knew this phrase. How did you learn this phrase? Okay, I speak, I speak enough, if I went into a restaurant, I could order a meal, I can ask directions, if I go into a hotel, you know, I, I can get by. Because I lived there for a half year, and I've been back probably about six or seven times in the last 11, 10, uh, 12 years, okay? And I actually enjoy studying uh, Italian vocabulary and grammar. You know how some people like to do crossword puzzles? I hate crossword puzzles. <laughs> but I have a number of Italian grammar books and vocabulary books. And I, I, you know, and I listen to CDs and stuff. When I know I'm going to go, I was there two years ago. When I know I'm going to go for months in advance, I will listen to CDs and I'll really try to bone up to you know, build. And the interesting thing is when you're over there, I would be in a conversation with an Italian and I'd suddenly say something and I'd realize I didn't know I knew how to say that, you know? Uh, what I do know is um, non ho pronuncio molto bene. I don't pronounce very well. Um, but in most instances, only with one, or, I can only think of one or two cases, Italians really appreciated the fact that I tried to speak their language. 
I speak simply, and they speak simply and slowly. In fact, I would almost say piano, slowly. Um, uh, so, I, you know, when I went over there to teach in 2003, I knew two words. I knew vino and pizza. <laughs> and by the end of that semester, I could have basic conversations and have kept, it's a, it's a beautiful language. Uh, it's just a gorgeous language. Yeah. <clears throat> Which part of the process uh, do you enjoy most? I mean, you do the research and then you have to turn it into fiction. Yeah. And do you spend an equal amount of time on both? Or? You know, that, uh, it's not like I do one and then the other. They go hand in hand. Um, I was at a, a book fest down in Ann Arbor uh, last a week ago. And there's a wonderful novelist out of Boston named uh, B.A. Shapiro, Barbara Shapiro. And uh, she was talking about how, uh, because she has, a math, she has a background in mathematics and analysis, you know, and she's a novelist. She has this very elaborate system of using, um, of, uh, using note cards, different colored note cards, different colored pen, and she, you know, she plots everything out in advance. I can't do that at all. Um, I need to sort of just write the story. Sometimes I go down dead ends and have to back up. Uh, I want to discover what happens in the story. As an, I figure, if I'm surprised, maybe the reader will be surprised. So the first draft, the, really, the first few drafts are, are truly rough. But I start to realize, you know, this works, that doesn't work. Uh, and when I'm using historical research, which I've been doing more and more in, in my more recent books, um, the more I read, I, the, the beauty of reading history is it is stories. It's a story of humanity. And very often when I'm reading some history, I'll realize there's a whole chapter right here. There's, there's great scenes right on this page. Um, so I often, when I'm reading, I'll, I'll realize, you know, uh, if I was reading about, say, uh, the, the relations between the ardent Nazis and the rest of the soldiers who simply wanted to get along, survive the war, and go home, you know, they realized they really had a good deal because they were out of the war. They were safe. They were going to make it. But these guys were like, you know, no, we're, we're still fighting the good fight and all that stuff. That really happened. And, you know, I read certain details in certain instances, and I said, you know, this can work. So, I mean, again, not to go into great detail, but there, were, there are scenes in the book, though they're not factual, they are based on something that I found in history. So, they really interlock. And I couldn't possibly say, you know, I did this, and then I, you know, um, I also take years. Uh, someone in a, at another library asked, well, when did you start writing this book? And I think if I looked at my computer, the first drafts that have this title on it goes back to about 2008. Now, I haven't been working on it steadily all that time, or I should go this way for you guys. Um, uh, I, I like to put, the, I really believe that putting stuff, uh, putting your writing aside, uh, your subconscious works on it. I'll sometimes put something aside for up to a year or so and work on something out else. And then I'll come back to it and I'll read it as though I didn't even write it. I'll have forgotten a lot of what transpires. And I'll suddenly, it'll be very clear, this works, this needs to be dealt with. Um, so the two are very much interlock. Yeah. Did I see another hand? Yeah. How many books have you written? Well, written, that's hard to say. I've, this is my 10th book published. Um, I probably have written parts of another half dozen. Now, if I live long enough, as I have this, I call it a composting method, okay? Uh, I have big chunks of books, hundreds of pages, which used to sit in, in, in metal file cabinets in those days. I'm a transition generation writer. I used to write longhand and type it up on a manual typewriter, but now I do things on computer. Um, uh, I believe in this composting because, uh, as I said, uh, you know, being away from something, it's not like it's not, you're not working on it. You are. I think your subconscious, it's almost like there's a dream state uh, that really helps. And to me, reading something that I wrote so long ago that I really don't remember what it was about or how I describe things, when I read it, it's like I didn't write it. And it, that allows whatever critical faculties I have to really kick in. You know, so in most cases, I mean, any one of these books, I would say I probably was working on them on and off for anywhere from four to six years. And as I say, I've got some more, 
Um, I'm hoping to live long enough to finish a few more. Yeah, yeah. Um, any other? Yeah. Do you have someone that reads as you're writing, or someone that helps with editing? That's a, that's a, uh, I, the answer is yes to both. However, excuse me. I'm, I'm very reluctant to um, talk about what I'm writing while I'm writing it. Um, I. Uh, I've been very lucky in my married life. I was married for a long time to uh, the most wonderful woman, and um, I've been widowed since uh, 2011, and then I remarried this past spring. And in both cases, uh, I've, I've been married to two women who are the most ruthless editors you would ever want to meet, <laughs> which, means they're the best, they're, which means they're, the, they're, they're, they're what you need. Um, with Ellen, uh, my wife now, um, she's now learning not to ask at dinner, well, how did the writing go today? <laughs> Unless I bring it up. Because I really, there's something about, you want to keep a lid on it. I really believe that, you know, it needs to kind of fester within me. And then at some point, I'm going to show it. Because when I show stuff to her, I mean, she just, she's, she's amazing. Um, I'm currently working on a book. I'll talk about uh, some of what's coming up uh, with uh, the press next year. Um, I wrote a novel called Cold, which came out 15 years ago. And it's been out of print for a number of years. And uh, Michigan State University Press, which published this, is going to reissue three of my earlier books. I'm old enough that some of my books have been out of print for a while. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to still be alive when somebody's actually going to reissue them, which is becoming a very rare thing. So next spring they're going to reissue in paperback Cold and Firepoint, both of which are set here in the UP, hint, hint. And then The Invisible World, which is set in Boston, which is the city that I grew up in. Um, now Cold, I'm working on a sequel to Cold that uh, I don't know when it's going to come out, but uh, maybe like 2017, at least a year uh, hence. Um, I'm almost at the point, uh, Ellen has learn not to ask how's it going with the sequel but actually uh, probably later this fall I'm going to give her the whole draft and then I'm gonna for days while she's reading I'm gonna have to just sort of keep my distance and not you know I don't want to be in the same room when she's scribbling on it because um, uh, as some of my former students know I, I can dish out the criticism but what you may not know is that I can't take it very well um, uh, the, the new, I, I, I will tell you that the, 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 the sequel to Cold has one of the main characters come back from the first book, uh, um, a man named Del Mackey. Uh, and the working title of the book is Out. I don't know if that'll be the title, but I, right now it's the working title. You know how up here, at least in Mar Marquette, and I assume throughout the UP, people, um, they talk about certain people who live outside of town, and if sometimes really off the grid, no electricity, no running water, or sometimes sort of partially off the grid, but they live, they live out there. And in Marquette, they just say, well, he lives out. So this is about uh, a, a man who lives out, and suddenly, during a fierce blizzard, uh, a number of people, because of this blizzard, have to spend the night in his house, and their lives come unraveled altogether, and there's a hellacious storm as well. So that's all I'll tell you. And if you see my wife, don't tell her that much. <laughs> she doesn't know yet. What did you teach in Italy? Um, well, uh, I didn't teach Italian, I can tell you that much. <laughs> uh, this was a, a, a program uh, for American University students. And Northern Michigan, where I taught for many years, was part of this consortium. I mean, these were uh, colleges and universities from the Midwest and usually the, some in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, students would spend a semester over there. Uh, it was a program run by a group of Italian academics. Every semester, uh, one American university professor was selected from one of the schools that the students came from to go and teach a course. And I, I was very fortunate because it's competitive. I was fortunate to be selected. And I was thrilled because I'd never been to Europe before. Uh, so I, I taught a creative writing class. And I didn't realize until I really got going in the course that this was a bit of a departure. They usually the American professor who came over would teach something that was connected to either Italian history, art, architecture, you know, something that dealt with America, uh, with, with Italy. 
But in this case, the, the director, uh, with whom I've been great friends all these years, uh, um, Filiberto is his name, uh, he said, no, we're, we're trying something different. We're going to have the students do a, you know, write short stories about their experiences in Italy. And it was for me, it was just a, a great, great experience. And uh, as a couple of my young friends know, uh, I've taken groups to Italy uh, before, and, and I love introducing that culture to them. I think it helps uh, Americans see how there's such a strong connection between, uh, not in, let's say European culture certainly uh, has influenced American, and I think we have a strong affinity with, with, with Italy in particular. Um, so many have come over, and our legal system, our language, and the food has been pretty darn good. Anyone else? Yeah. I have a question on the prisoners of war. Yeah. Because I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi, and yeah. there happened to be, during this time, and there was a prisoner of war camp mm -hmm. there, and as a young child, um, the prisoners of war, because they were German, um, they were sent to, my father was an, an officer, and they were sent into the officers club to become chefs. Yeah. And I, I guess we just never, as a young child, I yes. never looked at them as prisoners of war, just as right. wonderful cooks. Right, right. Um, how, in, in other communities, how did people think of these people as, were they considered prisoners of war, or were they just considered I'm not surprised at, at, at the way you responded. I've had conversations, you know, when I've done visits to libraries, and I, I've gone to two conferences of the Michigan Historical Society. And these are people who are really into Michigan history. And uh, several times someone has said the exact same thing. As a young person, they were in the presence of these prisoners a lot. And um, they realized they were different because they spoke a different language and so on and so forth but they didn't think of them as being, you know, the enemy and so on and so forth. And in a lot of cases, uh, a, a great affection grew up between the families, you know, the farm families where the prisoners worked. They, uh, in fact, uh, when I was at a conference uh, back in March down around Detroit, there was a man who grew up in northern Wisconsin who said that, um, uh, and I think this is probably true in other parts of the country, but he said, that a good number of the prisoners who lived in uh, in the prisons in Wisconsin liked it so much that they, after the war, they contacted the families that they knew, the, the Americans they knew, and, and asked if they would sponsor them so they would help them come back and settle and become uh, work toward becoming American citizens. And in many cases, that's exactly what happened. So what you're saying doesn't surprise me. Could you all hear what she said about the... Yeah, um, that, that, uh, uh, in your experience, they weren't, they didn't seem like prisoners and they weren't guarded and all that sort of thing. Which is, you know, to me is the great tragedy of, you know, of war, is we are all human beings. Um, and yet somehow uh, uh, it, it, it works out that we, ha we take sides and, 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 and things divide. And I don't see where or when we're going to. Did, did you, did they serve a lot of German food when you were a kid? Um, I, Wiener I, schnitzel? I love Wiener schnitzel. <laughs> I remember distinctly that my father was spoke, the, the reason he did not have to go overseas is he spoke German. German. Yeah. And yeah. so he was the interpreter, but he yeah. required my older sister and I at Christmas time to learn how to sing um, oh. Silent Night in German yeah. to yeah. sing to the prisoners, right. or to, right. to, the, to the guards. And, yeah. You know, things like that I distinctly remember. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that, 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 that's, again, you know, that, that in doing the research for this, uh, it really gave me an appreciation. Uh, I wasn't born yet. Um, I was born a little bit after the war. Uh, but the fact that, you know, here we have a world war, and most people perceive the United States and, and Germany and Austria as being arch enemies. And yet when you place people from both societies you know, next to each other, living with each other every day, they may, in most cases they manage to work it out. Um, and there are a number of scenes where uh, I, that that happens, particularly in the, the first two parts of the book while he's in the camp, and they do go into Munising. He meets uh, Kiara, eventually the, the young gal who becomes his wife. Um, they go in in a truck, they're just picking up supplies, and they're in this little shop, and, and there's this beautiful young woman with dark hair and her old mother 
is mumbling in Italian. And, you know, they're not accustomed to hearing Americans speak Italian. So all of a sudden, you know, the mother says, yeah, well, we, live, we, we came over from the Sioux. There's a lot of Italian Americans over there. And, and right away, there was a bond. You know, actually, the daughter at first was like, all right, keep away from me, you know. And then finally she came around. Anybody else? What yeah, Ron. Uh, Ron, you promised me you weren't going to ask a question. Oh, this is easy. Bro. Okay. But you're not going to mention Anton Chekhov, right? Uh, no. Okay. No, uh, yeah. That's good. <laughs> Ron, Ron is a former uh, colleague of mine from the department, in the English department, and he loves to ask trick questions, but he's not no, going to do that tonight. If there's some uh, contemporary writer that you find inspiration in, John, mm. uh, uh, just a name we can walk out the door with and think about, well, maybe I'll read it. Or her. There's so many of them. So many of them. Um, well, I'll tell you, the, the, a book that I, I, that I just started, I probably read about 70 pages of, uh, and actually, when we were having dinner, I mentioned Frederick Bush, who probably died within the last 10 years. Uh, Frederick Bush probably wrote several dozen books, both fiction and nonfiction. And uh, he has a son, Benjamin Bush, who lives in Lower Michigan, uh, who I, uh, when I was at this, this uh, book fair down in Ann Arbor uh, a week or so ago, Benjamin interviewed me in, in, in a certain event. And Benjamin said, I've read a number of Frederick Bush's books, and Benjamin sent me, he said, you need to read this one book of my father's because it's about the prisoner of war situation in England during World War II. The book is called A Memory of War, or the, I'm sorry, The Memory of War. And, um, well, I've only got, just start, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I mean, he, this man is a virtuoso writer. Um, uh, he, he, can, he can crawl into the lives of characters and reveal um, uh, things that mo most writers can't get to. So Frederick Bush, I, I would say, I don't like to use the word influence because I think I'm influenced by everybody and everything I've ever read. Uh, but Frederick Bush right now, I, I, I reread some of his short stories recently. If you ever want to read a great American short story, read Frederick Bush's story called Ralph the Duck. Uh, in my workshops, I don't know if Linda, when she were in my workshop, we, but many semesters, we would read that story. Um, uh, it's, it's just a brilliant American story. Just terrific. So, Frederick Bush. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I've kept you long enough, and I, I, I greatly appreciate this. Let me, let me conclude by giving you a bit of an apology. I mean, I would love it if you, if, if you would love to have a book signed and so forth. There are some available. But what happened was, I was at um, the books, the, the library, the public library in um, Iron River, which is over right on the Wisconsin border, last night, and I just about sold out of Wolf's, Wolf's Mouth. And I got in touch with, even though the book, this book is published by Michigan State University Press, it's distributed by University of Chicago. They have this relationship. So the books are warehoused in Chicago. So I called them. They were supposed to send me a new card last week. It never arrived. I called them. I said, can you possibly get a carton of books to Sault Ste. Marie? Thursday. They said, we can't possibly do that. So I have just a couple of copies left. I have others that I would love you to, to look at and, and maybe get. But what I can do is um, I went to our local bookstore market, the wonderful store called Snowbound. Uh, they always have my books in stock. They're just great. They're great friends. Um, and they have these slips. I can give you a slip. And if you either call them or email them and tell them that you want a signed copy, um, I live five minutes from, the ha from their store. I'll go in and I'll sign it, and you can tell them if I, you want it signed in a particular way to someone in particular, to yourself or someone else. And also, because I intended to have the books here, uh, they will only charge you the cost of the book, and I'm going to cover the, uh, the, the mailing charge, okay? And that's the best I can do. I, I feel terrible about this because um, this carton didn't arrive in time. Um, but there are other books available, okay? So. Thank you very much. It's been wonderful to, to see you.